Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. The commemoration of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie is honoring the spirit of indigenous sovereign nations who have maintained their cultural values and traditions, proudly proclaiming, we are still here. The Fort Laramie National Historic Site and the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for Wyoming Chronicle is provided in part by the Dragicevich Foundation, supporting the work of the Wyoming Women's Foundation. My name is Affy Ellis. I represent Senate District 8 here in Laramie County. Um, I was elected to the Wyoming Senate in 2016. And this past session, I brought Senate Joint Resolution 2, along with several other co-sponsors who I serve with on the Joint Tribal Relations Committee. And this joint resolution commemorates the 150th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Fort Laramie. This resolution was important for us to bring forward because Fort Laramie is such an amazing place um, that has a very long history. Uh, geographically, it's a place where two rivers meet and where the plains meet some mountains. But historically, Native people have always gathered at the fort. And throughout history, we've seen that it's been a place where emigrants have stopped to get additional supplies as they were traveling west during the mid-1800s. Um, it served as a military fort. And uh, there were rendezvous men, um, fur trappers, and traders that often spent a lot of time at Fort Laramie. And so throughout history, it served many different purposes, and it's such a treasure for Wyoming. Serving in the legislature has been a tremendous honor for me, and you know, one part of that is that I'm Native American. Um, my uh, tribal affiliation is Navajo, and so I definitely have an interest and passion for those kind of issues. And I hope people, when they visit Fort Laramie, um, really take the time to embrace the, not only the historical importance of that area, but what that history has meant for Indian people and non-Indian people today. Um, certainly the treaty was in, uh, designed and one of its goals was to try and cease some conflicts that happened uh, between non-Indians and Indians um, during the mid-1800s. And as we see, history um, will tell us that those treaties were often broken. Um, but it's important to recognize their importance because these treaties really solidified the United States' relationship with tribes as sovereign nations, and that's something that still holds true today. Um, but at the same time, they're also the mark, they mark the beginning of an end in some ways for how tribes were living prior to the signing of those treaties. Um, they defined la land boundaries where tribes were supposed to settle, um, and really they followed some efforts to try and assimilate Native people. So. Um, there's a, a lot of mixed reactions about what these treaties meant, but hopefully visitors today will take away some of that history and just understand that complex dynamic of, of what those treaties meant and continue to mean. One component of the resolution states that it calls on the federal government to uphold its treaty obligations. And initially, the treaty that was signed um, back in 1868 had some defined land boundaries. And um, as more Western immigration um, continued and as valuable resources were found in the Black Hills, we saw that the United States broke very important elements of those treaties. And so today, I think it's really important for the federal government to remember that there are still people living on reservations, that promises were made to provide for some basic um, necessities. And so that's kind of morphed into you know a different kind of trust responsibility as we know it today, but the obligation is still there. And um, you know, sometimes I do think it's frustrating when people are f forgetful of that history and you view Native people as relics of the past that somehow maybe extinguished or exter were exterminated once these treaties were signed. And that's simply not the case. Um, I think tribal governments um, are continuing to grow and become stronger and more sophisticated. And we're seeing some really positive things that tribes are doing for their citizens nationwide. And so hopefully these treaties are a reminder that Indian people are still you know, contributing members of society today and they're doing their best to provide for their citizens and uh, we should be working on improving relationships between tribes and states and tribes in the federal government. I think the native perspective about the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie is probably fairly mixed. Um, on the one hand, I think it's an important reminder of tribal sovereignty and that tribes have been dealt with as sovereign nations and that's a status that continues to be very important today. 
On the other hand, uh, the signing of these treaties does mark a significant departure in how tribes used to live and how their existences used to be. Um, but one thing I do find remarkable is the fact that despite um, hundreds of years of federal policies against Indians, from uh, removal, if, when you're talking about things like the Trail of Tears, to assimilation, to wars, um, to eras where the federal government tried to terminate its legal responsibility to recognize these tribes. Despite all these efforts, um, you know, tribes have still continued to persevere and still exist today. And so we've been very careful in talking about the treaty to make sure we're not using the word celebrate because there are definitely um, difficult aspects in talking about that history. But to commemorate it is absolutely important. And um, hopefully there will be ways of celebrating the fact that um, tribes still have very vibrant cultures. Um, hopefully we can use this as an opportunity to celebrate that cultural heritage. And so um, I think that it's important for visitors, not only in Wyoming, but across the country, to consider visiting the fort, um, participating in some of those events, and hopefully gaining a better understanding of why the history of this place is so important. And our thanks to Senator Affy Ellis, and we're here now at Fort Laramie at the National Historic Site with Eric Valencia. He is the Chief of Interpretation and Visitor Services here at Fort Laramie. Eric, welcome. And with Marianne Newbert, Marianne, you're the museum curator here at, at Fort Laramie. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle, both of you, and thanks for having us today. We're on the bank of the um, Laramie River here, and Marianne, I'll begin with you right behind us, and I think our viewers can see the um, teepees in our, in our picture here. This is where the Treaty of Fort Laramie was discussed, negotiated. What would, be, what, what would you say happened right here? Well, behind us, uh Basically behind where the, the teepees actually are was where the council area was located. Um, it's where tribes came to talk with the members of the Indian Peace Commission um, and to learn about what was in the treaties. Uh, the treaties took place on April 29th, May 3rd, and May 10th. Um, the Sioux were the first group, the Crow were the second group, and the Northern Arapaho and Northern Cheyenne were the third group. Um, and they basically came to, to listen to the Indian Com Peace Commissioners and to see what the U.S. government was offering them in exchange for their land. Now, this wasn't necessarily the first treaty. There is a, there's an earlier treaty of Fort Laramie that I'd like you to talk about just briefly. It dates back clear to 1851. Yeah, uh, 1851 treaty. Um, it does carry our name officially, uh, 1851. Uh, treaty of Fort Laramie, however, it was negotiated at Horse Creek. Um, they brought in multiple tribes and they brought in roughly 10,000 people and the landscape here could not um, take care of itself so they moved it over to Horse Creek which is roughly 40 miles into Nebraska. But that's, um, that's important because the Native Americans or Indians at the time and maybe still today, they agree by consensus. Tell us what that means. Um, consensus means that, you know, you know during treaty uh, in 68, they would listen to the commissioners and then they would go amongst themselves and talk amongst themselves. And what they would do is they would come up with, um, you know, something that they all believed in, um, that they all agreed to. And that actually was kind of a, a foreign thing to the U.S. government. Uh, the U.S. government was looking for signatures of chiefs. Um, they weren't looking, they, they, they didn't understand that the idea that, um, you know, these chiefs came to consensus with their people that were there, but it wasn't consensus among the entire tribe because not every chief was here. Eric, what can visitors take from where we're standing at here today when they come and see, I mean, it's, we're here on a beautiful day, but there's so much history that really began right here. And that's correct. And I, I like to think that when a visitor arrives here at Fort Laramie, they are transported to the past. So at this particular site, you know, given our wayside information that we have here, that visitors would be able to look across the river here, see the three teepees that are displayed out there, and imagine a large congregation of natives negotiating with U.S. representatives here at the fort in that exchange of culture and working to bring peace to the area here. Before we um, move along and see more of, of Fort Laramie and what's offered here, there's really kind of two segments in my mind. There was the, the time in Fort Laramie became more of a military outpost, 
but well before then it was more of a place where fur traders and traders met. Is that an accurate way to think about the history of Fort Laramie? Um, early 1800s, yes. Um, this was a very important fur trading area just because we are in a very convenient location at the confluence of the Laramie and Platte Rivers. Um, we're easy to get to, we're, we're flat. I don't think that topography has changed any. Um, you know, as I was telling you before, the history of this place goes back 10,000 years though. Um, so, you know, the history is, is much longer even than fur trading. And even when trading started, it wasn't just um, white people who were coming to the area. It was Indians trading, it was white people trading, and it was them trading with each other, amongst each other, and beaver and buffalo and those types of things. Is that an accurate description? Yes, Fort Laramie has been the gathering place for nations for thousands of years, as Marianne has uh, stated. And it is also, to this very day, still a gathering place for visitors from around the world as they come to take a view back into history. Before we move on, this summer, we're gonna remember the Treaty of, of, of Fort Laramie of 1868. What can visitors expect relative to that, Eric? Visitors can expect a, an experience here that they may have never experienced. And that, of course, again, they, uh, going back to Fort Laramie being that gathering place of the many, the many different and, or diverse and vibrant cultures that have been gathering here at Fort Laramie for centuries. And it's that experience of diversity, of the Native American uh, contribution to this fort, uh, to this area that we seek to incorporate into the, the larger story of the area and Fort Laramie. Is this a celebration? Is it a remembrance? How is it going to be framed? The commemoration of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie is honoring the spirit of indigenous sovereign nations who have maintained their cultural values and traditions, proudly proclaiming, we are still here. The MPS and the tribes have been working together recognizing the intent of the original negotiators, acknowledging the negative impacts that resulted, and strategizing ways to seek solutions in a forward-looking manner. We have more to see. We're going to go to the oldest standing structure in the state of Wyoming. We're going to go see Old Bedlam, so stay with us. Eric and Marianne, we've kind of come about 150 yards north, and now we're in front of a building called Old Bedlam, the largest or the oldest structure in Wyoming. Eric, what's important about this place? Well, at one point it did serve as the administrative buildings here at the fort, and Marianne will tell us a little bit about some of the furnishings that we have. I will say that this is probably one of the most important sites or that uh, folks will have because legend does have it that it is the oldest building in Wyoming. And visitors are always amazed, especially in the summer when they climb up on the top of the balcony up there. Beautiful view of the site. It is just one of those uh, areas that visitors, uh, that is a must see for visitors. Lots has happened inside this building, Marianne, and it really has been transformed several times. Yes, it has. Um, when it was constructed in 1849, um, it was originally for um, apartments for, for housing. Um, very quickly became the administration building. It's been non-commissioned officers housing. Um, it's been ho um, housing for two uh, officers' families. Um, this building, as beautiful as it is, was not actually one of the most, one of the places people actually wanted to live. It was very drafty, very cold. It is, it is beautiful. It is very beautiful, but it wasn't very well constructed. <laughs> not well heated? No, um, the, the walls actually are filled with adobe, which you think would help, but it still was cold in the winter, hot in the summer, um, not very well sealed windows, let drafts in, so. Um, Give us an idea of what life was like here during the fur trading days and then later on as it became a military post? Um, as far as fur trading days, um, you know, it was probably lots of, of communication between traders and, and Native Americans and, and all the people who came here. Um, they come for a few days, a week, a day, do we know? Well, it, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is, is that in those times that when traders did arrive, they stayed for a a substantial amount of time. It's not like today where we, you know, think of uh, obtaining supplies in a matter of hours or even sometimes in a matter of days. 
it would have taken a long time to reach this area and they would have stayed until they would have gathered the supplies that they needed or bartered for the supplies that they needed uh, stuck around and socialized and you know had cultural interactions and then eventually left so but for immigrants here they were it was a race against weather and winter as to how long they stayed and for immigrants, exactly. They would probably have come in and gotten resupplied as quickly as possible and then continued on their way, depending on the weather situation. And so then we come to the later time when it was a military post. Marianne, what was life here if you were, if you were a soldier? Here? Um, if you were an enlisted soldier, it wasn't very good. Um, lots of enlisted soldiers who came here were actually immigrants from the Northeast. Um, and because they were considered undesirable classes, they, this was the only job they could get was in the military. So they would join the military and they would be shipped out to a place like this, which is incredibly different than what they're used to. Um, so, you know, they would do what they could. They would march around in units. They would, um, you know, hang out on the porch of the cavalry barracks. They would do their daily drills. Um, life here wasn't actually, it's it was boring, pretty boring. Right word, yeah. <laughs> it was pretty boring for them. Um, if you were an officer, it was a completely different story. Um, officers came here as part of their career path. Um, they would want to go out west to, to make their, you know, a higher grade in their careers, um, and then hopefully at some point, you know, get shipped off somewhere else. But that's what they did. Before this, and, oh, and go ahead. And for enlisted men, you know, their life was very regimented, if you will. It's a, it was drill, 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 and more drill. One of the special things that we have here at the fort is even to this very day, you can still hear the bugle call of the regimented life of the soldier. And that was that bugle call that dictated exactly where they needed to be, what they were supposed to be doing. And as, as, as the morning came along, you awaited the bugle call and that determined how your day went. We're at Fort Laramie, but there was a time when it was a different place. It was either Fort William or Fort John. Give us a little bit of the back history, if you will. Uh, both were fur trading posts, um, obviously areas where people met and traded, um, communicated with one another. Fort William, uh, we do not know the location of it. There are lots of theories, um, but we do not know the actual location of it. Fort John, we do. Fort John was actually located right behind uh, Quarters A right there. Some of the other buildings that are close by, um, are they barracks? Is, is that what, are, what is right behind us as we're visiting today? Much of the remaining structures are um, housing units. Um, the two that are right behind us, those are actually duplex officers' quarters, so two for two families. Before we move on, at any one time um, when it was Fort Laramie, how many people might have been here? Did it depend on the time of year? What, what did it depend on? It depended on how many units were actually out of the fort. Um, this is a place where they came, drilled, um, got ready for wars outside of this area. Hundreds? Supplies, thousands. Thousands. Turnover rate was very high amongst enlisted. Yes, it was around 50%. Around 50%. <laughs> um, some of them joined emigrant wagons and just left. Uh, some left on their own. Um, it's probably safer to leave with an emigrant wagon or with another soldier at least because once you leave here, there is nothing to the landscape. Um, and that's just a little bit safer idea to, to, to have left with somebody, but yeah. On your way west like everyone else. Yes, uh, you know, a lot of, some of them heard about the gold, gold in California. Oh, that's better idea than, than this. <laughs> so they would, you know, join some uh, a wagon train going to California, or they'd heard about homesteading. Well, you know, the reason a lot of them came to the, this country was for a better life. Well, I can get a homestead in Oregon, so I'm gonna join this wagon train that's gonna, that's on the Oregon Trail. We have more to see, so we'll move along. We've now progressed to the final stop on our tour of Fort Laramie, the Fort Laramie National Historic Site today. We're in the Settler Store. Eric, what are people gonna see when they walk in here? Well, it really is a trip back in time to the supplies and necessities that anyone would be, well, that would be necessary for survival on the harsh northern Great Plains. Sure. Give me an idea of what those supplies might have been. Well, as we look through here, you can see there's anything from your uh, basic hygiene elements, such as combs, toothbrushes, uh, toothpaste, things of that sort. Then you'd also have your canned goods, um, and which is always a favorite, you know, your coffee, your tobacco, uh, and a favorite for the children, of course, candy. Sure, sure. There's blankets and hats and 
and clothing also here too. How did, how was business transacted, Mary Ann, when, when someone needed something here in the store? Um, most, it was either cash, credit. Um, you bartering? They also could trade. Uh, the buffalo robes that are right behind you actually were probably, could have been traded with Native Americans for things like beads and, and you know, the food supplies and stuff. Uh, some soldiers could buy stuff on credit. Um, they would have a, uh, the settler would have a running book and at the end of the month he would actually not, he would actually give the uh, amounts owed to the paymaster of whatever unit the soldier came from and it would be taken out of his paycheck. Mm -hmm. um, or cash. Um, anything here could actually be ordered by the settler. So what you see here is kind of a very small amount of what they actually could come uh, to, to get. They could get furniture, pianos, um, if they need more cloth, um, dresses, they could get anything. So give me an idea ge geographically of where things came from, came from and how they got here. Again, keeping in mind the mid to late 1800s. A lot of the goods came via wagon train. Um, later on, it was, it was actually railroad and wagon train. Early on, from Omaha? Um, Probably where, farther east. Farther east yet? Yes. Uh huh. And then about what time did railroad service come? Roughly in the 1870s. Would that have been coming then from Cheyenne? Yes. Okay. So when, go ahead. Eric. And that, that, that really is the story of Fort Laramie as it sits at the confluence of two major rivers. And as you can imagine, these rivers were highways of their, of their day. And it's these, where these two rivers meet that, you know, you find the gathering of nations, the gathering of peoples, and it really is the crux of our diversity story here at Fort Laramie. We're not far from Nebraska. Um, geographically, the best way for folks to come and visit Fort Laramie would be, Eric? Highway 26, right up the North Platte, just like those immigrants did. Okay, or just off I-25, um, exit um, south or north of Wheatland a little bit? Exit yes, 92. Sir. And it would be a very easy way to get here. What are the hours of Fort Laramie? Uh, Fort Laramie is open sunrise to sunset. Uh, our visitor center hours from Labor Day to Memorial Day are 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Our summer hours are extended, and of course that would be Memorial Day through Labor Day, where we are op our visitor center is open from 9 a.m. till 7 p.m. And if visitors want to come here, maybe they should know they're not, you know, real close to a restaurant or, or a hotel. It's something that visitors need to plan for. Yes. And local communities do have those services. The nearest communities to the fort here, of course, are Lingle, Wyoming, Fort Laramie, Wyoming, Torrington, Wyoming, and Guernsey, Wyoming. So to kind of circle back from where we started, though, we're really remembering and, and, and honoring, if you will, the Treaty of, of 1868. Um, this would have been in a, in a place that did exist when that treaty was, was signed. Is that right, Marianne? Yeah. And so what was the later history of, of where we're standing? How long was it um, a, a, a going concern, if you will? Uh, the fort itself was decommissioned in 1890. And after that, it was sold actually to homesteaders. And we can actually thank the preservation of this fort because of those homesteaders. They these are used, local people? Yes. They use these buildings for farming and ranching in their homes. Um, and then when they were purchased by the state of Wyoming, given to the federal government, you know, the structures were actually in really good shape for the most part. And, um, you know, as far as forts in, in the National Park Service, we are one of the best preserved. Still a lot of archaeology has occurred to this date. Lots of research happens here, or yes. has happened here. Yes. St and still more to be discovered in your mind? Absolutely. Like the location of Fort William. <laughs> okay. And so archaeologists will probably tell us that story. What else is on the horizon short term for Fort Laramie? And I think as, as far as a commemoration, one thing that we hope to achieve as far as extending the story of Fort Laramie is to get the commemoration the stories, of the treaty. Yes, to get the stories from um, the descendants of those who were here during, during the, uh, the time of the signing and also um, to get a better idea of, of what their lives are today um, because you know their lives are very much were very much determined by their ancestors signing the 1868 treaty. And are there opportunities for people to interact with you to provide more stories and more research? 
There is an extensive archives um, in this park. Actually, I think we just be nice. We have probably one of the best. Um, one thing we do have is something called the name file, which has 36,000 names of people who've passed through Fort Laramie. Um, and it can be everybody. It's Native Americans, it is immigrants, and it is the military. And a lot of people come looking for information about their ancestors here. Um, also, we have information, just you know, historical information um, about the history of the park. Um, and also, you know, we have an extensive just general library about uh, with topics pertaining to military history, um, some immigrant history, and some Native American history also. And um, as you saw today, we had our first group of fourth graders actually on our, in what we refer to as our educational season. And we are very, very proud to say that a large number of Wyoming fourth grade students uh, come to the fort uh, to learn more about the history of Wyoming as it encompasses everything uh, that is Wyoming, if you will. And we, we were watching that tour interacting with rangers, learning directly about the history of Fort Laramie. Exactly, and that is, of course, again, part of our educational program. Throughout the summer, visitors can arrive here at the fort and they would find a living history dressed, uh, a, li a person dressed in living history attire attending to the store here, uh, telling the story of the sutler and of the importance of this particular building. We also offer interpretive programming throughout the day in addition to our living history stations. And they can um, um, get the most information by starting at the visitor center? That's correct. A that's... Lot, lot of books for sale there. Which, which ones are the most popular? Well, the most popular happens to be the general survey of the history of the fort here that is a book entitled The Pageant of the West. Well, Eric and Marianne, it's been a pleasure. I think that we look forward to what will happen here this summer as we remember the Treaty of 1868 and um, its relevance even today. So thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Thank you for, thank you. for, for coming to, out to the fort and, and, and allowing us to be a part of your program. It was our pleasure, and I'll, I'll tell our viewers, this is, this is kind of a little gem that's kind of on you know, the eastern fringe of Wyoming that is a wonderful place, and there is a lot of history that is available to be learned right here. So thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle.